Hello and welcome piano enthusiasts. I'm going to do something a little bit different with this video and uh, talk through it. Uh, I don't normally do that, but uh, yeah, normally I have like a soundtrack going that I played or something like that. Um, so this is a Schiedmeier, Schiedmeier uh, semi-concert grand piano. One piece ivory keys on it, which is very rare. I really don't see that on hardly any pianos. Most pianos that have ivory keys, they're they're separated between the heads and the tails. Uh, the heads being the the front, uh, the wider portion, and the tails are the uh, you know the piece between the black keys. Um, so yeah, here I'm just taking it apart. <clears throat> Stick with me. I've got a little bit of a cold. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just looking at the hammers here. They they do have a bit of wear. Uh, not too much, but, uh, you know, it, it was used. It's 40 years old, so I'll, I'll have to uh, file the hammers and voice them and everything. Uh, you can see a little bit of... Uh, it's a Renner action, German Renner action. You see... Uh, you know, I, at first I thought it was a coffee stain there, but I wonder if some technician used some kind of hardener just on those notes, because I there wasn't any stain anywhere else. You know, there wasn't on the hammer shanks, it wasn't on the key bed, wasn't anywhere. So I, I wonder if it was just some kind of... I've seen technicians use all sorts of stuff. Um, Um, so I don't know what that was. Um, so yeah, so now I'm just wheeling it through the door and that door I have, I think it's a 64 inch door. Maybe I should have got a bigger door, a uh, double door there, uh, cause the concert grand just barely fits in there. Uh, they, they're a little bit wider than a normal, like a baby grand, um, so here I'm gonna, I've got the fans on, I'm gonna blast the dust out of it. Uh, with Now, you gotta be careful doing this. If, if you have an air compressor, um, you know, the, the water gets trapped in the, in the tank and, and then you're spraying misty water on the piano, you don't wanna do that. So I've got a, a filter uh, on the hose, just before the hose there. To catch the water. I'll clean up the agraphs here. Those are solid brass, so they shine out pretty well. Just use some, uh, I call it red pad, or 3M uh, Scotch Bright. And there's a paper clip that was tucked under on top of the soundboard uh, underneath the plate. Those, I mean, stuff like that, um, you know, you'll be tracking down buzzes for a half an hour. And, uh, you know, just it's normally like a paper clip or a guitar pick or something. You'll see I pull a couple guitar picks out later, but... <clears throat> Wheel the piano back. Oh, there's a guitar pick. Now I'm going to take the action stack off of the keyframe. Little piece of cardboard there. I keep the screws so they, they go back into the same hole. And now I'm just going to tighten all the uh, action frame screws, all the uh, all the screws that get neglected over, you know, they probably haven't been tight, tightened in 40 years. Here I'm checking out the key bushings. You'll see they've got quite a bit of side-to-side -side movement. Um, there's probably uh, 
15, 20 thousandths of an inch of a of side to side play there. That one's pretty bad. Um, and then on the sides, they're really not that bad. Uh, you know, there, there's probably three or four thousandths of an inch there. But I just go ahead and replace all of them uh, since I'm I'm not just going to replace just the middle. You know, I'll, I'll replace all the key bushings. Taking the keys off the action frame there, you'll see all the dust that gets collected. Uh, you know, over the decades. And get the steamer going so I can steam out the key bushing. See, the glue that they use is it's moisture resistant, but it's not uh, waterproof, and the heat helps it come off, uh, helps the key bushings come off too. So now I'm taking my dial calipers and measuring the pens. And just getting the bulk of the dust out there. Then I'll wheel it into the other room and get the dust that was the the dust that's kind of trapped in the fibers of the felt and blast that out with the air compressor. You can see it coming out there. And I'll cover the key top because I don't want them getting wet. And I'll begin to steam them out. Just a little bit of steam. There's a trigger on it. And you can see I'm, I'm just barely feathering the trigger. I mean, if, if you pull that thing all the way back, it'll really blast out at you. But I'm really, I mean, it looks like I'm using a lot of steam, but it's really just not. Hardly any. It's all just coming right back out. And uh, if the manufacturer uses the correct glue, then they come out pretty easily like they are here. Um, you know, sometimes you really got to fight them. Or, or if they've been replaced in the past and they don't use the right glue, then... Uh, you know, you gotta, it just takes a lot longer. <clears throat> I'll flip the keys over, do the front rail. Steam those out. So the, the front rail bushings, you want, you don't want them Technically, they're supposed to be between two and five thousandths of an inch wider than the pen itself. So you you don't want it, you know, you don't want too much friction, but you don't want it too loose either. Uh, so here I'm just um, I've got a couple different sizes of felt or it's cloth. Um, you don't want it too thick. You don't want it too thin. And then those brass little pieces, those are called calls, uh, C-A-U-L-S. And those are, I believe those are the 139 thousandths of an inch. Or may, no, I think they're the 136 thousandths of an inch. Because the pens themselves are 136. So on, on the center rail, you want it between 0 and 2 thousandths of an inch bigger, um, the, the opening. And on the front rail, you want it between two and five thousandths of an inch, or that's what I was taught anyway. <clears throat> There's a Steinway dealer just, uh, you know, about 25 minutes from me, and they've got a new Steinway on their floor. They're, and the, uh, it's an A, and the, the keys are real loose. I'm like, is this, but it's just how it came out of the factory, so... I don't know. I I mean, different pianists have different uh, preferences. Um, I mean, I, I guess it feels a little bit lighter maybe, but you're really losing power the looser they go because when you press the key down, you're actually kind of pressing it. You know, if you're using your pinky to press 
the key down, you're actually kind of pressing it to the side, so you're losing energy uh, the sloppier the keys are. And with the center rail being between zero and two thousand, you you're actually you want a you want at least a gram of friction, or about a gram of friction in the key. Um, so between your up weight and your down weight, uh, just the key itself, um, and you average it out, um, you you should have some friction. If you don't have any friction, um, then you're losing energy, and the actually the repetition springs, they're supposed to push up on the hammer, but what they'll actually do is they'll push down on the key, and you'll see uh, Later in the video, I have to go through and loosen all the repetition springs because once you get the solid, once you've replaced the key bushings, um, then the repetition springs have something to bounce off of and actually push the, the hammer up like it's supposed to rather than pushing the key down. So um, you're, you're losing energy with loose key bushings. And here uh, I've got zoomed in on just some damage on the front there. I don't know, maybe somebody dropped a binder or something. So I'm grinding out the where somebody had. Uh, colored it in the past so you want to get rid of that color because you don't want it contaminating uh, the um, the new material so this is a dye that uh, won't react with the polyester the new polyester that I'm gonna pour on there so that dries in about 10 minutes I think I let it dry for like an hour I go and do something else uh, I think I'm taking off the, the lid. I'm going to begin to make my dam there. You want to be sure to, to fill past, you know, fill more than you have to because you don't want to, you don't want, you don't want to have to fill twice. Then you just waste time. <clears throat> but the more overfill you have, then the more sanding you do. So, so I've mixed the dye into the polyester resin, and then uh, the catalyst in there. You'll see later. I between adding too much catalyst and the water, I warmed up. You warm up the the polyester just a little bit so it um so the air bubbles can escape well if you warm it up too much <clears throat> excuse me the chemical reaction happens a lot faster and then the bubbles don't uh aren't allowed to escape because it just it cures so fast which is what happened in this case as you'll see um as I kind of midway through the sanding, you can see some bubbles, but I'm not going to redo it because it'll, it's on the edge and nobody's going to notice it. It'll look good when it's done. Um, you will notice though, some parts that I begin to sand through and it, the, the finish is just so thin on this, on this edge here. <clears throat> but I can just color over those later. So, uh, yeah, my little oscillating sander that I was using, I think I had like 120 grit on there. Now I'm using some 600 wet sanding. bring it down level flush with the surface it's really hard to sand just the area that you want to sand what I mean is 
you're always going to it's it's you're always going to like overlap and you're going to be sanding the part that you want to sand but you're also kind of half sanding the existing finish and you don't want to do okay so now you can see the little bubbles <clears throat> now I'm sanding with them um, I think that's some 2000 or maybe it's 1000 and here's some 2000 and here's some 4000 and you can see uh, some little parts where I uh, began to sand through but uh, once I get that buffed out sanding scratches then I'll just take a little um, black acrylic uh, it's like super high gloss black acrylic and just kind of paint over that and now I'm showing you just the general you know scratchiness haziness of the finish that's the front lid and this is the big lid you can see uh, on the left side there there's some kinda I, would, I wouldn't I would say they're deep scratches but there's no way to just buff those they have to be sanded out so and those are kinda everywhere so I just decided to bite the bullet and sand the whole lid <clears throat> So I've got some, uh, got my dust collection. And I really like the Merca Sanders. Um, and I use it with the Abernet sandpaper. So the dust, the dust collection is just fabulous on this system. So it started with a thousand grit there. And this will take care of all the scratches. I mean, if if there was a really deep scratch, you, you got to decide, you know, do I risk cutting through the finish, sanding it that low, or do I fill it? And fills really, um, you know, they you can try to make them invisible, but it, it's really tough. So I try not to fill unless I absolutely have to. <clears throat> so I've sanded the whole thing except the the wider part there because that's underneath the front lid so it didn't get as many scratches um, so uh, now I'm just going back All right, yeah I guess I already did go back with uh, and touch up some of the scratches that I didn't get out the first time so now here's some doing 2000 grit wet sanding Then I'll go to 4,000. And I stopped it here just so you can see my reflection on the left side. I mean, even 4,000 grit, I mean, you can see the, the haziness, but uh, you can all already see my reflection. <clears throat> here I'm buffing. And what I'll find is that because my process here, I only use the, the one method. I only use the random orbit sander. So I don't know if I'm looking at, like if I get done sanding with 2000 grit, I don't know if the grit that I'm looking at is 2000 or if it's, or if I didn't get rid of the 1000. So what I found was when I was dry sanding with the 1000, um, I don't know, I must have picked up some debris or something or the the dust didn't get collected. So in some spots, um, I actually created some probably some like five or six hundred grit scratches while sanding with the <laughs> with the one thousand. So I decided to redo it, start with um, 
wet sanding with a 1000 grit um, Aberlon pad. So the the wet sanding with the pads, it those pads absorb the sanding slurry, so you're less likely to uh, kind of grind into the surface as I did with the dry sanding. Um, so it added probably an hour worth of, and I mean, each of those pads are like three bucks or something. And I probably went through like 30 of them. So, I mean, doing this is expensive and it's, I mean, and as you'll see, I mean, it looks a whole lot better when it's done, but I don't know, maybe you can tell me how do I get rid of these polishing marks. Um, so right now I'm polishing out the buffing marks. So now you can see my reflection's pretty clear there. But when you look at the reflection of the light, it's you can see kind of this haze of the polish. <clears throat> so there's before with the scratches. And here's after, and the scratches are gone, but you do get this kind of, I don't know, it's like the polish buildup, or maybe it's still the buffing marks. I mean, overall, I don't think anybody's going to complain, but, I mean, if you know how to make this perfect, please let me know. <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to go to uh, just polishing the brass. There's some tarnish on some of the brass hinges. I'm going to do the big hinge later. I'm going to do the uh, the big brass casters. And before I put the lid back on, I'm going to tighten these screws because they, <clears throat> they're impossible to tighten with the lid on. And when the piano gets moved, they they butt the piano up against, they, they butt the lid up against the skid. So sometimes that makes the, that'll loosen the um, screws there. And I did, I did the screws on the, the lid hinges on the lid, tighten those as well. And now I'm just uh, kind of machining the screws there of the long hinge. Just kind of a before picture of the scratches on the front lid. I call it the front lid, the front half, of whatever you call it. And rather than doing the whole piece, um, you know, starting with a thousand grit or six hundred grit, I, I there were just a handful of scratches there, so I just sanded those out by hand, <clears throat> and the rest of the scratches came out with the buffer. General rule of thumb is if you can feel a scratch with your fingernail, it's not going to come out with the buffer. If you can't feel it, it might come out of it with the buffer. And now that the glue has dried on the key bushings, and I think I've already sized them with the uh, Pro Felt. Um, so the new bushings, like I said, they have to be a certain size. So the calls, you can put the solution on the felt called Pro Felt, and that kind of expands the fibers in the felt, and it will swell or contract to the call. Um, so the opening will be exactly 136 thousandths of an inch, or supposed to be. <clears throat> now like there I went back and um, you know some some end up a little bit tight and you have to use your key easing pliers and also with steaming the balance rail hole on the bottom of the key becomes swelled so um, I just have to loosen those a little bit so there's not too much friction on the bottom of the key here I'm just tightening the rest of the screws and the action because over 40 years they come loose the wood swells and contracts and... <clears throat> and here I'm gonna start 
filing the hammers. Not only are there grooves, but the tops of the hammers are flat, which was creating a really nasty sound on the piano. It's, it's, grooves aren't terrible. You actually want grooves because that means your uh, hammers are mated properly to the strings, meaning you're hitting all three strings at the exact same time. Or if it's a bass note, maybe two strings. Um, but it's when the hammer gets flat on top, you're, uh, you, it just creates a real nasty sound. So I use the file there. It's like a metal file. I do a couple at a time to get the bulk of it off. And then I use the, the larger strips there just to make sure over kind of a few hammers to make sure um, I've got the top surface flat. So I'll have a better chance of mating the strings uh, with less time involved. <clears throat> And this is pretty rough on my wrist. I used to be able to do two of these a day, but now, I mean, I like you can see, I'm just, I'm resting. Well, maybe you can't see because it's so fast, but I mean, I'm, I'm resting in between and kind of rotating my wrist, trying to free it up a little bit. There are other ways of doing this. Um, there are little like mini belt sanders, but they, they take a lot of material off at a time. <clears throat> and here I'm just kind of, you know, creeping up on it where I want it. If this were an older, like, you know, Kimball, I probably just would have used a, a mini belt sander and because it is a lot faster, but it's it's just harder to um, make that shape of the hammer, give it that pear shape, uh, make it perfect. Here I'm testing out a few notes, so I've I've reshaped all the hammers, and I'm noticing that uh, the hammers are still pretty bright. So I'll voice those down later. Now I'm starting to adjust uh, let off. I'll adjust the guides to where they need to be and then I'll pull the action out and do the in-between hammers. <clears throat> Here, I'm just cleaning off the keys. When, I, when the piano first came in, I mean, it was kind of dirty. And you'll see the before pictures later on. But, you know, a little bit of dirt there. But on ivory, ivory kind of absorbs a lot more than plastic. So the color actually changes. So when the piano first came in, I mean, they looked yellow. And I was worried. I was like, oh, man, I'm going to have to sand these. I'm going to have to bleach these. But, I mean, after I cleaned them, I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> I mean, they look great. I mean, are they sparkly white? No. Uh, but, you know, ivory is not supposed to be sparkly white. It's supposed to have a, it's supposed to look ivory, you know. Uh, here I'm pointing to a hammer that is um, warped, you know, hammer shank that is warped over time. So I'm just heating the shank there and... I guess you can say bending it back so that'll straighten it up oh what I was working on earlier that tool um, it, it's a let off tool and it's it's really fast um, once you set your guides I mean most of the time most technicians have like a 
either this big contraption at their workstation that they can lower a, f a perfectly straight piece of wood and tighten it, or they use this line that they um, tighten. To, well, there's Lydia. <laughs> Yeah, she, <laughs> she's helping me. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, we we had one of those let off tools at a piano shop I used to work at, and it's, it's just you don't. I mean, you don't have to like unscrew anything and tighten it back down and adjust the line. Um, so it, it's real fast. I mean, you can do let off in like ten minutes and drop. And here I'm starting to just do some test notes, voicing, voicing there with the needle. Now it's a little out of tune, I probably should have tuned it first. Just trying some different volumes there. You'll notice the F sharp I didn't do and it sticks out a lot. Um, so that was my starting point. So the the other notes came down a bit. <clears throat> so there I just lowered the damper up stop rail because the dampers were lifting too far and once you press the key down if you press it down fast then it it catapults the the damper lever up and then it it rebounds back down on the back of the key and you feel that that rebound um, so it's you you don't really want that. Um, here I'm machining the brass on the uh, big casters. And I'm polishing the ferrule there that goes that uh, screws onto the bottom of the leg. And I took the pedal wire off. I'm going to polish the pedals and the pedal rods. That green bottle um, knocks on. I don't think they. I I'm running low, so I um, tried to order some more, and they. I guess they discontinued it. But uh, I did find one place that I guess still has some stock, so I ordered four more bottles because it, it's. Uh, and that stuff is really, really nasty. I mean, it's like heavy in ammonia. You get a whiff of that stuff. You don't want to be breathing it in. Uh, but it, it's, it works pretty fast. Cuts out all the tarnish. Whereas, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different brass polishes. There's Brasso, there's Flitz, there's Moss. There's, I mean, there's just a whole bunch. And the Noxon takes it off fast, but it doesn't leave you with a perfect mirror finish whereas the moss and the uh, flits will give you a perfect mirror finish but you might have to do it three or four times um, so here there are some scratches uh, on that rim there where the uh, where the fallboard key cover uh, comes in so I you know sanded those out with some 400 then some 1000 2000 4000 then some polish here there's the polish and put the screw back in and no more scratches and uh, here I'm just recoloring in your your oils in your hand they they kind of eat through the paint on the side of the black keys Um, and here's some damage to the fallboard where it hits the cheek block on the on the base side. So I've got to fill that. And right now um, I'm sanding, there's another part of, on the stretcher above the keys, 
that had some scratches, so I sanded out those scratches. Now I'm going to sand this level. And it was pretty close, so I started with 600, then 1,000, 2,000, 4,000. And the polish really isn't good at taking out the 4,000 grit, so you, really the best thing for taking out sanding scratches is the, uh, the buffer, the edge buffer with the dry compound. And here, the black keys, they don't have enough aftertouch, but the key dip was fine, and the key height was fine, so um, I just uh, took out some punchings underneath the front rail there, uh, underneath the black keys, so, so you'd really get the feeling of you actually played the note. Um, there's not enough aftertouch, it just feels heavy, because you feel like you didn't play the note, but you did play the note. Uh, if it if it doesn't go through let off, then you don't get that that sense of gratification that you played the note. Um, so here, some more scratches on the uh, on the music desk, music rack. Sanded those out, buffed, and here here were those other scratches where where you t where you pull the music desk out. It scratched the stretcher there, so I put a piece of felt on the underside so it wouldn't scratch it anymore. Um, and here I'm replacing some of that worn green felt. I didn't have any green, so I just replaced it with black. <clears throat> black looks pretty good. And here are those little uh, side pieces that catch the where the music rack, you can see where it... Uh, holds the music rack up. Um, so that felt was all worn there, so I replaced that as well. And the piano was very close to in tune when it came in, so I'm just doing a routine tuning here. And, I, you know, if it's a shop tuning, I'll, I'll tune it with my uh, Veritoner app on my phone. Um, it's like a $600, you know, it, it calculates the best tuning for that piano. It's not like a guitar tuning app. <clears throat> uh, taking some pictures. And there you have it. So here are some before photos. You can see inside, you know, pretty dusty. You can see some tarnish on the brass there of the uh, lid prop. You can see those the grooves in the hammers, the dust there. You know, the brass logo there is a little bit tarnished, so I polished that out. I don't think you saw that on the video. You can see that just general light scratchiness of the lid. I mean, it's 40 years old. It's in pretty good shape, but... You know, it's, you don't want to give the customer something to complain about. So you can see the the, the decal there uh, shined up pretty well. And just the dusting on everything inside really just, I mean, everything just sparkles now. You know, it, I mean, it, it looks fantastic now. And it sounds great too. Um, just pictures of the action. So that I mean, the hammers have plenty of felt left on them. So I mean, it's like, do you replace them? I they really didn't need replacing.
just got, I mean, just a beautiful sound. There's great sustain in the, in the mid range. It's got a big bass. And it feels incredible. I mean, I can't do trills that fast on any other piano. I mean, my trills aren't that great, but. This is uh, just parts of Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. The parts that I can still uh, fumble my way through when I used to play the whole thing. Ever since having Lydia, I haven't really sat down and practiced. Uh, I think maybe more than a couple hours. I mean, really. I'm just going to let the piano ring uh, ring on just to see how long the sustain is and it just goes on and on and on I think like 40 seconds and I might have been playing maybe mezzo forte um, so I mean the piano is just built incredibly well you know obviously it's German but I didn't take any pictures of the underneath uh, but the joinery underneath is just beautiful. Um... something a little different. It's uh, Albanese, Isak Albanese. Just kind of to show you the different colors that the piano can uh, generate or that the performer can, can get out of the piano. I wish I knew how to really mic a piano, because we're, I mean, you hear the piano, but you don't feel it, you know, it's like, it's there, but you don't get, you're, you're losing a lot. Um, it's just like the other, when I recorded this, me playing this piece on uh, the Steinway I restored about a year ago, I mean, you, I don't know, I, I just recorded it with the iPad, and then it's all tinny, and I mean, you get the music, you get the gist, but you don't really get what it sounds like um, in person. In that recording, I was kind of disappointed uh, with just the quality of sound. Because in person, the piano sounds great, but just the recording was just so... You know, it, it picked up all the upper partials and didn't get hardly any of the bass, so... Now here I bought a little uh, recorder, so I turned down the gain a bit. So now we don't get as much as the upper partials, but now we're missing out on some of the power. And this is a different section in the Albanies. It's um, just beautiful chromatic lines and real tough to voice, for the performer to voice the melody over the accompaniment. And this, you know, I, 
just love these tonalities from Albanese. I mean, it's just beautiful. I should show you the sheet music. Seven flats. Um, <laughs> A flat minor, this part being in like C flat major, all sorts of double flats all over the place. It took forever to learn. Yeah, and once it gets back to the fast part, I'm just really rusty. So. bass on this piano. I mean, it's, it's really dark and rich. It's just got this kind of biting quality. And that's just a, because the piano is such great quality. 